Okay, guys, welcome to the stream. Thanks for bearing with us as we set up the show for today, Wednesday, August 22nd. We're happy to be with you here inside our newsroom in D.C. You see on your headline that we're ge gearing up for uh, today's celebration of Ben's Chili Bowl. It's a local D.C. eatery that has so much history here in Washington. It's the only business that stayed standing in all the burning of the businesses during the riots in uh, April 1968 and beyond in the civil rights movement. It has a lot of history there. So we're gonna show you a piece of that ceremony from this morning. Unfortunately, our live camera went down for the morning, um, running off to some other news. But if we get that back, we're gonna show you that. So for now, take a look at the ceremony spearheaded by our mayor here in DC and the owner of Ben's Chili Bowl, Virginia Ali, is a big part of it as well. Take a look. To a national audience. And I had a litany of things I was going over that I thought were iconic for Washington, D.C. And there were two things that I mentioned that got the biggest round of applause. The second biggest round of applause went to the iconic Howard University in Washington, D.C. But the biggest round of applause was for our very own Ben's Chili Bowl. You know, we have more than 20 million people that come to D.C. just to visit us every single year. There's 700,000 of us who call Washington, D.C. home. Yeah. And there have been decades of Washingtonians that have come right here to U Street our Black Broadway to visit our businesses. And uh, we know that Lee's Florist is still here. Let's give a big round of applause to Lee's Florist and Ben's Chili Bowl. But Mrs. Ali, one of the biggest testaments to you and your family is when we can go in your restaurant and meet employees that have been with you since the very beginning. So you know not only that they serve up good food, but they're good people because they have invested in employing D.C. residents and helping them have families right here in Washington, D.C. So we wanted to give you a small, another honor uh, in, in make sure we, I think we're gonna unveil it today, Ben's Chili Bowl way. And we're yeah. we're gonna have Nazim is gonna is Nazim gonna show us Ben's Chili Bowl way? Um, oh, there's Nazim. What? Mrs. Alwin? Okay. Why don't we just get Nazim? gentlemen, the two people responsible for Ben's Chili Bowl Way are council member from Ward 1 right here, Brianne Nadeau, and the chairman, Phil Mendelson. Please come forward, guys. Please come forward. to see all of you here. It's great to honor an icon for the city of Washington, 
Ben's Chili Bowl. I want to acknowledge a couple of colleagues who are here, besides Councilmember Nadeau, Ward 1, who's standing to my left. Uh, Councilmember Robert White at large, sitting over at the far end, and former council member uh, Vincent Orange, now the president of the Chamber of Commerce, is standing over there, and Councilmember Jack Evans is behind me. We're all going to come back up in a minute because he has a uh, resolution from the council that he's going to present. A couple of months ago, Councilmember Nadeau came to me and she said, you know, there's going to be this event here to honor Ben's Chili Bowl in 60 years. What can we do? And Councilmember Nadeau and I talked about it for a bit, and we came up with the idea of the legislation that authorizes this naming of this block of U Street yeah. uh, after Ben's Chili Bowl, Ben's yeah. Chili Bowl Way. So that that honor is not just for today, but it lives on and on, and as folks drive down the street, they will be reminded of this great tradition. And why do we celebrate this? We celebrate this because Ben's is a great local business. It's a great black-owned business. It's one of the few surviving black-owned businesses going back to the 1950s, Lee's Florist Industrial Bank. Those are all reasons to honor it, as well as the fact the Ben's Chili Bowl. And meet employees that have been with you since the very beginning. So you know not only that they serve up good food, but they're good people because they have invested in employing D.C. residents and helping them have families right here in Washington, D.C. So we wanted to give you a small, another honor uh, in, in make sure we, I think we're going to unveil it today. Biz Chili Bowl Way. And we're yeah. we're gonna have Nazim is gonna is Nazim gonna show us Biz Chili Bowl Way? Oh, there's Nazim. What? Mrs. Alwyn? Okay. gentlemen, the two people responsible for Ben's Chili Bowl Way are council member from Ward 1 right here, Brianne Nadeau, and the chairman, Phil Mendelson. Please come forward, guys. Please come forward. the city of Washington, Ben's Chili Bowl. I want to acknowledge a couple of colleagues who are here, besides Councilmember Nadeau, Ward 1, who's standing to my left. Uh, Councilmember Robert White at large, sitting over at the far end, and former Councilmember 
Uh, Vincent Orange, hey, now the president of the Chamber of Commerce, who's standing over there, and Councilmember Jack Evans is behind me. We're all going to come back up in a minute because he has a uh, resolution from the council that he's going to present. A couple of months ago, Councilmember Nadeau came to me and she said, you know, there's going to be this event here to honor Ben's Chili Bowl in 60 years. What can we do? And Councilmember Nadeau and I talked about it for a bit, and we came up with the idea of the legislation that authorizes this naming of this block of U Street uh, after Ben's Chili Bowl, Ben's yeah. Chili Bowl Way. So that that honor is not just for today, but it lives on and on, and as folks drive down the street, they will be reminded of this great tradition. And why do we celebrate this? We celebrate this because Ben's is a great local business. It's a great black-owned business. It's one of the few surviving black-owned businesses going back to the 1950s, Lee's Florist Industrial Bank. Those are all reasons to honor it, as well as the fact the Ben's Chili Bowl. that they serve up good food, but they're good people because they have invested in employing D.C. residents and helping them have families right here in Washington, D.C. So we wanted to give you a small, another honor uh, in, in make sure we, I think we're going to unveil it today, Biz Chili Bowl Way. And we're, we're going to have Nazim is going to and as you guys can see on this feed, they just repeat themselves here. This is just sort of one portion of the ceremony from this morning. You can see Reverend Jeffy, Jesse Jackson right there behind Mayor Bowser. And then to his right, Virginia Ali, the now owner of Ben's Chili Bowl. So unfortunately, just a small clip from this awesome ceremony this morning. But parties going on all day. So if you're local and you're swinging by that U Street area, expect it to be closed off like you see it here in the video. Reactions are pouring in after the body of Iowa student Molly Tibbetts was likely discovered. Vice President Mike Pence tweeting he is heartbroken by the news. The 20-year-old disappeared while jogging in her Brooklyn neighborhood July 18th. Her disappearance prompted a massive month-long search. On Tuesday, 24-year-old Christian Rivera led officials to a body believed to be Molly's in a rural cornfield southeast of Brooklyn. Rivera was then charged with her murder. We have confirmed with Homeland Security Investigations that he is an illegal alien and we believe he has been in this area now for four to seven years. Texas Governor Greg Abbott tweeted in part, an undocumented immigrant is charged for the murder of Molly Tibbetts. This is why so many Americans are angry about sanctuary cities. It's why Texas banned sanctuary cities. It's about safety. Tibbetts' death likely to reignite debate over illegal immigration and President Trump is already weighing in. You heard about today with the illegal alien coming in very sadly from Mexico. And you saw what happened to that incredible, beautiful young woman. Should have never happened. Illegally in our country. We've had a huge impact, but the laws are so bad. The immigration laws are such a disgrace. Officials are waiting for positive identification on the body. If Rivera is convicted in Molly's death, he faces life in prison without parole. In Washington, Ray Bogan, Fox News. Well, these are two people who at one time were very close to President Trump. They both primarily faced charges for their own business dealings. But in the case of Cohen, some of the allegations are very close to President Trump. President Trump didn't seem to miss a step last night as he led a boisterous rally in West Virginia. But it didn't take long for the special counsel's investigation to come up. Fake news and the Russian witch hunt. We got a whole big combination. Where is the collusion? Just hours earlier, the president's former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, was found guilty of eight financial crimes, a win for special counsel Robert Mueller. 
It doesn't involve me, but I still feel, uh, you know, it's a very sad thing that happens. This has nothing to do with Russian collusion. And the president is right that the charges against Manafort don't directly relate to him. But his former personal attorney, Michael Cohen, is another matter. He pled guilty yesterday to charges that include campaign finance violations, payments to two women believed to be former adult film star Stormy Daniels and former Playboy playmate Karen McDougal, that he claims came at the direction of what prosecutors only describe as a candidate for federal office. And that may be a problem for the president. If the prosecutors accept what is in this indictment, then the president just became an unindicted co-conspirator. Now, none of this means that the president will necessarily be indicted. But if Democrats take over the House in November, they could potentially use these allegations as a basis for impeachment. In Washington, Doug Luzader, Fox News. Technology giant Microsoft today revealed that two conservative think tanks, the International Republican Institute and the Hudson Institute, have been hacked by a Russian military outfit. The same outfit in which 12 officers were indicted last month by special counsel Robert Mueller. Visitors to the websites would be redirected to fake sites where their passwords were stolen. The Hudson Institute in particular was in Russia's crosshairs for its recent paper, Countering Russian Kleptocracy. It describes how Russian oligarchs have exploited the world financial system to launder money. If you want to deter Vladimir Putin, whack him right in the oligarchs. Armed with a court order, Microsoft said it seized six Internet domains used by the Russian group. In a statement, Microsoft said, quote, We have now used this approach 12 times in two years to shut down 84 fake websites associated with this group. A Kremlin spokesman today denied the allegations. It isn't clear, he said, quote, who the hackers in question are. It comes as two Senate committees today examined Russian influence in the U.S. election system, with Democrats especially anxious to avoid 2016, where the U.S. intelligence assessment found that Russia favored Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton and worked clandestinely to affect the outcome. Democrats are fearful of a repeat in the 2018 midterms. My goodness, if we can't come up with a way to safeguard the integrity of our democracy in the next 80 days, shame on us. Republicans maintain that Russian interference isn't favoring either party. Rather, it's Putin's strategy to sow discord and deepen the U.S. political divide. He believes the only way Russia can be strong is for America to be weaker. And one of the ways he wants to weaken us is by dividing us internally against one another more than we already are. Whatever Russia's motivation, the federal government wants to stop it. Congress has approved $380 million for the states to bolster their election security. States are racing to spend that money before the midterms. And only five states still rely on computerized systems. The rest are all returning to some form of paper ballots. In Washington, Doug McKelway, Fox News. Technology giant Microsoft today revealed that... It was terrifying. It was like the worst day of my life. Lacey Guyton holds tight to her two-month-old daughter as she thinks about what could have happened to Raina Saturday afternoon. The infant accidentally locked in a hot car, 911, unwilling to send police or fire. Then I was just so like shocked and like, okay, they're not coming. I have to get her out of here. Nobody's coming to help me. Lacey was visiting her grandparents in Waterford. It was time to leave. She put Raina in her car seat and the car doors inexplicably locked. The keys were inside and so was the baby on a hot August afternoon. Immediately, Lacey grabbed a chunk of asphalt and tried to break the window while her grandmother called 911. My granddaughter just put her baby in the car and the car door locked and we can't get in it. We don't unlock vehicles unfortunately. The dispatcher said she would transfer them to a tow company but this wasn't any car this was a car with a two-month-old baby inside. She says ma'am we can't unlock cars or break windows and then you feel so helpless you think all the help we thought we were going to get the only help we were going to get we don't have it. She said, we have to call a tow company. And I'm kind of like, Grandma, we don't have time to call a tow company. Like, I don't know how many minutes I have, you know, until she's passing out. Unable to break the window, Lacey called 911 again and reached the same dispatcher. Can you send a fire department to come break my window open? I just need it open. I can send you a record service. They will charge you, but a fire department doesn't come out for that. Well, okay, because, I mean, she's, like, crying in there. I keep checking on her. She's screaming at this point, making herself even more hot. And... She again tells me that we have to you know, call a tow company. They don't come out for that. Um, and then she transferred me to a tow company. Finally, Lacey used this tool, broke out the back window, and rescued her baby. She was really sweaty, um, you know, screaming, and just, I mean, like drenched in sweat. She was probably in there like 10 minutes. 
Um, so we immediately just get her out, get her inside, cool her down. It's the most helpless feeling to see your great grandbaby in there screaming and crying and, and just wet with sweat. We want this corrected. We don't want anyone else to lose their baby because this wasn't taken care of for us. The chief of Waterford Police agrees. He apologized to the family and tells us this was definitely a mistake. It's a common sense issue. You know, you call 911, you expect for somebody to come and give you some help, and we certainly should have gone and done that. And we made a mistake and we didn't, and, and, and we, need to, we need to fix that. The chief says this was a veteran dispatcher, someone who really should have known better. He says she will face some disciplinary action and everyone will have more training on how to handle a call like this. I do appreciate their um, apology, but that it's not something that even needs any training to know. It's common sense. You send help when somebody is begging you to come help save their child out of a hot car to something that anybody should have known. It's just common sense. In Waterford, Amy Lang, Fox 2 News. It was terrifying. It was like the worst day of my life. Lacey Guyton hold. They went through a pure hail, no doubt. Police calling it a miracle after two toddlers were found alone near a highway in Camden, Arkansas, after surviving a single car crash that killed their mother. According to police, 25 year old Lisa Holloman was driving with her two sons, ages three and one, when the crash occurred. A female driver was found deceased, uh, ejected from the vehicle. Some are calling three-year-old Kylan a hero for saving his younger brother after he was able to get out of his car seat after the crash, climb through the sunroof and up a hill filled with bushes to get help. When he climbed up that car, seeing his mother laying there dead like she was, he tried to wake his mama up. Kylan was discovered walking along the highway Monday morning, and when police investigated the area, they found the crash scene with Kylan's one-year-old brother still strapped into his car seat. Both boys suffered minor scrapes and bruises and were treated at a local hospital for dehydration. Police noting these two young boys were especially lucky considering the extreme summer heat. A three-year-old and a one-year-old being able to survive in the elements, you know, southern Arkansas with how hot it is, the humidity. Uh, we've had pre uh, pre precipitation since then. Adding to the tragic loss of their daughter, Holloman's family was told at the hospital that Lisa was four weeks pregnant. The cause of the crash is still under investigation. Brian Yenis, Fox News. Already dealing with one natural disaster, Hawaiians are preparing for a possible direct hit from Hurricane Lane later this week. Hurricane Lane is a very serious uh, storm uh, that has potential to do damage and cause harm. Therefore, we must be as prepared as we can. The monster storm churning in the Pacific Ocean with sustained winds of 160 miles per hour was upgraded to a Category 5 storm Tuesday night as it moves closer to the Hawaiian Islands. The slow-moving storm expected to hit one or more islands in the coming days and cause significant damage. Strong winds, a lot of rain because it's a very moist storm and a lot of surf. So we're gonna have flooding in all likelihood. And that's not all. Islanders can anticipate storm surge, mudslides, and possible tornadoes. Ahead of the storm, officials are taking every precaution. I did sign an emergency proclamation um, an, an hour or so ago uh, that allows us to be proactive and preposition state equipment and assets to support uh, county emergency responders. We are anxious. And residents are also bracing for impact, stocking up on essentials. Flameless candles. I got batteries in here and I have a lot of dried foods. Hurricane Lane will likely weaken as it moves toward the state, but even if it doesn't make direct landfall, the storm's still potentially life-threatening and has the ability to destroy property. In New York, Jackie Ibanez, Fox News. There was an Air Marshal Jeopardy game board hanging in the Orlando field office. And this is what started the culture of the retaliation um, and discrimination against minority groups. A game former Air Marshal Henry Preston claims was rigged against minorities at OIA. 
Our Fox station in Charlotte first reporting on the allegations, Preston telling them and now us between 2007 and 2010, his supervisor encouraged the marshals to target African Americans for suspicious persons investigations. It had nothing to do with fighting terrorism whatsoever. Um, all they wanted to do was get stats in what they call surveillance detection reports. Preston says marshals were encouraged to target all minorities, but especially African Americans. What were some of the things they were telling you? Um, go after the blacks, although they use the N-word. Um, they're the ones who have the most warrants. The supervisors, he says, threatened and berated them if they didn't comply. We even had one supervisor tell one of our fans that he would burn their house down. That was the threat? Yes. Now Congresswoman Val Demings writing this letter to the acting inspector general for the Department of Homeland Security, urging him to investigate the, quote, extremely troubling allegations. Congressman Darren Soto also joining in on the fight. Should these allegations prove true, this gentleman needs to be fired and there needs to be a top-down shakeup. Preston says he's brought all this to lawmakers and the TSA. The TSA sending this statement to our Charlotte station, Fox 46. The Transportation Security Administration and Federal Air Marshal Service do not tolerate discrimination of any kind, period. Federal Air Marshals are from all walks of life and come to work every day for one reason, to protect the traveling public. I'm hopeful now, um, but uh, cautious. I'm very, very thankful to be able to help my father have normalcy to his life. Florida's Stand Your Ground self-defense law once again in the spotlight, igniting calls for action by civil rights activists and politicians to abolish the hotly debated statute for good. Well, it has happened again, and again we're here, and we're going to keep coming until we see some justice in this case. This time, it's all caught on camera. You Knowing Trayvon Martin, we didn't have a video. It looks like he's been shot and he's dead. I shudder to think of what would happen if there was no video in this case. Video shows Michael Draca use his legally concealed handgun to shoot and kill an unarmed Marquise McLaughlin after he pushed Draca for confronting his girlfriend over a handicapped parking spot. He's on the ground. He's five to or at least 10 feet away. There's no, there's nothing in the hands of the victims that would indicate he's going to shoot, stab, or beat him. And he's in fact turning away. We really don't see any of the factors that would support stand your ground here. The Pinellas County Sheriff initially did not arrest Draca, saying the law prevented him from doing so. Three weeks would pass before the state attorney's office formally arrested and charged him with manslaughter. I think this is gonna be one of those cases where the defense tries to argue stand your ground, but it's not It's not going to be a stand your ground case. It's going to be a manslaughter case with no real defense for why he shot somebody. The 2005 law says people fearing for their lives do not have to retreat before using deadly force to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm. Protesters compare this to the shooting death of Trayvon Martin by George Zimmerman, who claimed self-defense and was acquitted of murder in 2013. It is a law that may be legal, but it's not moral. Draca's lawyers say in part, the legal team is not going to speak publicly about defense strategy, except to say that a wide variety of defenses are being considered. They also plan to fight to get Draca's $100,000 bond reduced at a joint bond and arraignment hearing on Thursday. He faces up to 30 years if convicted. In Clearwater, Florida, Ali Rafa, Fox News. Some of the top stories there that we're covering inside our newsroom on this August 22nd. It's Wednesday. Thank you guys for joining us on our stream today. Right now, um, when it comes to politics in the White House, we know that Vice President Pence is down in Corpus Christi. He just flew in. He'll be making some remarks in Rockport, Texas, later at the end of the 1 o'clock hour Eastern time. So we'll be trying to bring those to you if we get them in live, which we should. And then later on in the afternoon, President Trump uh, giving the Medal of Honor away. He's um, hosting a ceremony inside the White House, and we'll have that live for you on our Facebook page. So. 
just be alerted to that if you want to look um, into what's coming up in the afternoon. But right now we have a live feed of the Senate floor. We'll hang out there for a little bit and hear what they are debating before we go over to some more of the top stories that we've uh, been covering today, today and tonight as a recap of yesterday. As I have, that Judge Kavanaugh will be an excellent addition to the United States Supreme Court. He has outstanding qualifications for the court, but some of my friends on the other side of the aisle are desperately seeking to find an argument, any argument, to derail his nomination. The latest attempt is to claim that my friends on the other side of the aisle simply do not have enough information about him to make an informed opinion. Yesterday, the distinguished minority leader of the United States Senate came to the floor and suggested Republicans and Judge Kavanaugh are hiding something. This raises the question, Madam President, how much can you hide about a distinguished judge who's been issuing opinions for 12 straight years on the Circuit Court of Appeals? How much can you hide about that person's legal philosophy. Now in the past, my friend Senator Schumer has asserted that the best way to evaluate judicial nominees was to review their judicial record. Perhaps he should follow that advice this year, 2018, in our approach to Judge Kavanaugh. Back in 2009, when considering Judge Sotomayor's nomination, to the high court, my friend, the senior senator from New York, encouraged this body to focus on the nominee's 17-year record as a judge, rather than engage in what he called fishing expeditions. To supplement Judge Kavanaugh's 12-year record of judicial opinions, the Senate is receiving a lot of documents, more than one million documents so far, the largest volume of records ever reviewed for any Supreme Court nominee, the largest volume of records ever. So if our Democratic friends want documents, we've got them for our Democrat friends to read. In addition, Judge Kavanaugh has submitted more than 17,000 pages in response to the Senate Judiciary Committee's questions. The documents that have been turned in from his time in the Bush White House total more than 238,000 pages. Guys, we're gonna take you out of uh, the Senate floor and take you quickly down to Central Florida where there's a protest going on right now for Seminole County tax collector, Joel Greenberg. Apparently, you may have heard of this kind of in the news, he's facing backlash for an Islamophobic, allegedly Islamophobic uh, post on his personal Facebook posing a question to name one society that has, quote, benefited in any way from the introduction of Muslims. He said, asking for a friend at the end of that. Right now, some of the crowd down there is protesting um, him and saying that he needs to resign. So take a look. With that, I think this is one, but I would even say in this county, Seminole County, I personally know physicians uh, and health officials who are treating free and charitable clinics here in Seminole County. So I would say in his very county, uh, there are Muslim families and Muslim leaders who are making this a better place to live, period. Chris, why, why isn't an apology good enough? An apology is, uh, to me, when I read that, that's what conventional politics says. Uh, someone says something terrible, you can apologize and move on. Uh, this is not the type of thing that you apologize for. This is a guy who's opened up his heart and revealed the fact uh, that, that he is a bigot against Muslim communities. Uh, that is wrong. How does someone who is a countywide elected official represent a place as diverse as Florida? I think that's not good enough. Chris, are you surprised that Barr is only saying what he says and is not taking any action? I'm deeply surprised. What I, I think the bigger story here is we need more statewide officials. We need the Republican Party, the establishment of, of the Republican Party in Florida to say, look, this guy is not one of us. We don't support him. 
We don't condone what he said, and we want him out of office. We need the Democratic Party, statewide leaders in the Democratic Party, uh, to say it's not enough to apologize. We need new leadership in the tax collector's office and throughout the state of Florida. So he needs to resign right away. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I just was uh, with Brian Elijah, and I said that's the best name in the And I just did an interview with him. Give me one of my cards. Not sure. Your press person, but yes, Avery. <laughs> 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 Like that protest is ongoing down there in Central Florida. If anything does become of that, or if it becomes a little bit bigger, if there's any sort of presentation, we'll take you back down to Central Florida. But back here in DC, let's take a look at the Senate floor before we go over to some more of the top stories of today, this Wednesday, August 22nd. Selected an excellent jurist uh, in Judge Gorsuch, and I'm certain that Judge Kavanaugh will follow in the same great tradition. The outside noise involving Judge Kavanaugh should not deter the Senate from upholding its constitutional duty to provide advice and consent on judicial nominees. And frankly, we need to get this done before the first Monday in October when the new session of the Supreme Court will meet. If we follow the precedents of the last two confirmation processes, we will indeed have plenty of time to do that. I look forward to our consideration next month of Judge Kavanaugh. I look forward to the hearings which will deal with his many qualifications for the Supreme Court. I think the American people will be watching and they will see that he is a jurist capable and willing to do what is right and fair under the law. A uh, former professor summed it up very well. In writing about Judge Kavanaugh for the New York Times. Professor Akil Reed Amar said this, good appellate judges faithfully follow the Supreme Court, faithfully follow the Supreme Court. Great ones influence and steer it. As a circuit judge, Judge Kavanaugh has influenced the Supreme Court, has steered the Supreme Court. It's now time for him to be elevated to the highest court in the land, and I support his confirmation. And uh, Madam President, I yield the floor. Uh, what, what is the pending business? HR 6157. Thank you. Madam President. Senator Frank. 
he was crying in pain. And perhaps because Jeff Pigeon's Margate home had more lights on than those of his neighbors, this injured man ended up on his porch. I've been shot. Guy goes, I've been shot, help me. And, you know, I went and checked to see, I thought someone might be playing a prank on me. No one was. My hand on my leg. Please help me. Please help me. I've been shot for real. Hey, call, call 911. Call 911. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. All right, hold on, buddy. We'll take care of it. He actually knocked on the door. So that shows you that that camera just seen the motion and started rolling. The encounter caught on a doorbell camera. Late Monday, police said the man may have been shot in the 1800 block of Northwest 65th Avenue, which is just a few blocks away. Somehow this guy managed to get here. Yeah, that's a question we had too, why my door? <laughs> yeah. But we don't know, this is a very quiet neighborhood, especially down this street here. We have really no problems. Okay. It's just a random thing. Somebody needed help. Um, in our community, or in the United States of America, we know that we are a country that is filled with people from all around the world, and we are the very fiber of this country. And personally, as a Puerto Rican, from the Puerto Rican diaspora, who moved here three years ago, I feel offended too, because he is saying things to our communities. We are one people here in Orlando and the United States, and he is offending everybody when he says something about one particular community. Um, today we have several speakers. We're gonna start with uh, Russia Mubarak. <laughs> has revealed itself of Greenberg remarks that are not just Islamophobic, we've seen homophobic remarks, we've seen racist remarks, we've seen it all. It's not asking for a friend anymore, it's not trying to create healthy dialogue anymore. The time has come to an end. We are calling on Governor Rick Scott to remove Joel Greenberg.
to remove Joe Greenberg because it's about that was the spirit, the community that we saw all up and down the Gulf Coast. I remember visiting with two young boys. They were eight and ten years old. They were in their home when water rose to waist level and they had to be rescued by boat. I remember visiting with these boys and saying, you know, was that scary? How are you doing? And both boys started laughing and they said, are you kidding? We got to swim in our living room. That kind of joy suffused dealing with the tragedy. Since the floodwaters have receded, many, many families have returned home. Some bravely made a home in new surroundings, and the long, important work of rebuilding has continued. One year ago, you could take a boat through city streets. I still remember riding on a boat down Clay Road, a road in northwest Houston. I became a Christian at Clay Road Baptist Church. Clay Road was under eight to ten feet of water, and I remember taking a boat over cars, over trucks, going right down the middle of Clay Road. Today, our communities are coming back stronger than ever. Our businesses are once more a part of the Texas booming economy. And our neighborhoods ring with laughter and lawnmowers and barbecue grills. I'm humbled and grateful to say the amazing success of recovery has been helped by the willingness of Congress to recognize the extraordinary crisis caused by Harvey and to step up in a bipartisan manner to address it. Since Harvey made landfall, Congress has appropriated over $140 billion in emergency funding to respond to the 2017 hurricane season and to the California wildfires. Over three separate bills, we came together and made it possible to clean debris, to open schools, to rebuild homes for families, to give entire towns a new start. My colleague Senator Cornyn and I have worked hand in hand in each of these relief bills in the Senate, increasing the funds available to hurricane victims from those that originally come over from the House increasing the overall amount of funding for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for flood prevention projects, as well as for funding other mitigation activities under the Community Development Block Grant and the Disaster Recovery Program. Last month, as part of this funding, the Army Corps announced that Texas would receive nearly $5 billion for projects in the state as part of its disaster supplemental funding plan, projects dealing with long-term flood mitigation to prevent this sort of tragedy from occurring again, to rebuild in a way that is stronger and more resilient, that protects homes and businesses and families. This means that roughly half of the relevant Army Corps construction funds will go to projects in Texas intended to help prevent future flooding events. The Department of Housing and Urban Development has awarded over $10 billion in Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Funds to Texas. These crucial funds will go a long way and already have to meeting the needs of Texans who are continuing to repair and to rebuild from Harvey. We also joined together to pass an emergency tax relief bill. I joined with Senator Cornyn and Senator Rubio, and together the Cruz Cornyn Rubio bill granted over $5 billion in emergency tax relief to those who had been impacted by these hurricanes, allowing people who had lost their homes or had seen devastating damage to their homes to deduct those damages from their taxes, allowing people to take money from their, from their retirement savings, their IRAs and their 401ks, and use that, that savings to rebuild their home without paying the ordinary 10% early withdrawal fee. Giving a tax credit to employers, the many, many small businesses who kept the paychecks coming, even as the business may have been underwater, even as the employees couldn't come into work because their homes and cars were flooded. Until recently, houses of worship had been excluded from federal disaster assistance just for being faith-based. 
That policy was wrong. It was discriminatory. Many religious institutions were badly damaged or destroyed during Hurricane Harvey. I remember visiting a synagogue in Ireland, a neighborhood of Houston that had been flooded repeatedly and badly. I went to work with my colleagues, introducing legislation to fix this problem. A, a few months later, FEMA announced a critical reversal in their policy so that houses of worship would no longer be discriminated against and would be eligible for the same relief funds as everybody else. And then in February, our legislation codified FEMA's decision into law, ensuring that religious institutions were not discriminated against. We protected the First Amendment rights of our churches, our temples, our synagogues, which had suffered so greatly in Harvey and contributed so much to the relief efforts. And you know, that was one of the striking things, is how many people who were helping themselves had been damaged. Just over a week ago, I visited Ellington Base, meeting with the Coast Guardsmen, the swimmers and pilots who had gone into harm's way, many of whom their own homes were underwater. I visited with one Coast Guard pilot who had to walk through waist-high water to get to a parking lot where a helicopter could go and pick them up so they could fly and save others. That story over and over again was the story of Harvey. One year after Harvey's de devastation, the work continues. The Texas Gulf Coast continues to recover, and it will take years for the rebuilding to be complete. But as the Lone Star State rebuilds stronger than ever, we will keep moving forward. May we never forget the tragic days that Harvey hit our shores. But may we always remember the heroes who triumphed in the midst of darkness, the brave men and women who were a light to their countrymen. They are the best of America. They are the best of Texas. God bless them all, and may God continue to bless the great state of Texas. Thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor.
much. Thank you for those words. Now we have uh, Representative Charles Guillermo Smith. Good afternoon. We are here today with one unifying message for tax collector Joel Greenberg. And that message is that it is time for him to apologize, for him to acknowledge his words, for him to focus on his job of collecting taxes, not dividing the residents of Central Florida. And if he cannot do that, then it is time to resign. This all started because tax collector Joel Greenberg asked a question that I am ready to answer. The question was, what benefit has Muslims brought to society? Well, I'm here to tell you a story from my vantage point, and that is from the vantage point of how this community in Central Florida responded after the tragedy at Pulse on June 12, 2016. I'll tell you what I saw. I saw Muslim leaders from around Central Florida who stood in lines, who were wrapped around buildings so that they could donate blood to their fellow Americans who were dying in hospitals. I saw Muslims who were in hospitals, who were consoling families, and we saw Imams who were embracing mothers and fathers whose sons and daughters were murdered by hatred. We saw Muslims, we saw the Jewish community, we saw the Christian community, we saw straight people, we saw LGBTQ people, we saw men and women, and we saw every single person in Central Florida came together to say one message, loudly and clearly, and that was that love conquers hate. Yeah. That is who we are in Central Florida. That is how we, that is who we are as a community. And the comments of tax collector Joel Greenberg are an affront to the character of who we are right here as a community, not just before June 12th, but after June 12th, ever since, we have been coming together to demand an end to Islamophobia, to xenophobia, to anti-Semitism, to racism, to misogyny, to transphobia, to homophobia, to bigotry and hatred. We are here to say that Joel Greenberg needs to apologize, he needs to focus on his job of being tax collector, or it's time for him to resign. And if he won't do it, we need our state leaders like Governor Rick Scott to step up and make him resign. We need Rick Scott to have the courage that he didn't have years ago when he was campaigning alongside Donald Trump and refused to call him out for his xenophobia and his Islamophobia. We need him to have the courage now that he's running for Senate to remove Joel Greenberg from office. Can I get a hell yeah? Hell yeah! Are we united against hatred and bigotry? Hell yeah! Are we united against anti-Semitism? Hell yeah! Are we united against Islamophobia and xenophobia? Hell yeah! Are we united against homophobia and transphobia? Hell yeah! Are we united against misogyny? Hell yeah! We are Orlando United. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much for those powerful words. Um, as he said, we are all together a people here in Orlando, Florida, and the United States of America. Um, next, we have Wes Hodge. Hello, everybody. My name is Wes Hodge. I'm chair of the Orange County Democratic Executive Committee, and I'm proud to have my vice chair, Narendra Hyder, stand here with me as well. And we are issuing a, a letter to Governor Rick Scott uh, this afternoon asking that he remove Joel Greenberg from office because of his sustained attack upon the Muslim community of Florida. His social media posts are not constitutionally, constitutionally protected speech, yet they are words of hate. 
They are meant to vilify, dehumanize our Muslim neighbors, and they have no place in our society. Mr. Greenberg's words have created a toxic environment within Seminole County where followers of the Muslim faith cannot be assured that they will be subjected, they will not be subjected to unfair treatment in his offices. Because of his posts on social media, we contend that he has committed an act of misfeasance. His public comments rise to a crime or a charge of malfeasance, which is a violation of Florida statute. It discriminates or prohibits discrimination based upon religion at any place of public accommodation. People of the Muslim faith cannot come into Tax Collector Greenberg's office and feel like they will be welcomed. Tax Collector Greenberg has empowered his people to open carry within their office. Legal, legal, legal. And we have this horrible law called Stand Your Ground. And what happens when one of them says, I was in fear for my life? They are now empowered to kill an innocent person who walked into their office. As governor, you are empowered through Section 4, Article 4, Section 7 of the Constitution to remove any county officer for either misfeasance or malfeasance. We are asking that you remove him immediately based on this action. We are asking that your office conduct a thorough investigation, and if he is in violation of the law, you remove him from office immediately. I am proud to say that we are sending this not only on behalf of the Orange County Democratic Executive Committee, but the young Democrats of Orange County, the young Democrats of Seminole County, the Women's March of Florida, the American Muslim Democratic Caucus, the Democratic Socialist of America, Q Latinx, and Reverend Brian Fillwater. Anybody else that wants to join our petition is welcome to do so, but we want to send the message loud and clear that hate has no home here. 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 Thank you for those words. Next up, we have Paul Truman. Thank you all for coming today. Let me be very clear about this. My name is Paul Diaz Truman. I'm president of the Young Democrats of Seminole County. There's lots of buzz about how this is an Orange County co-opted event. That's not true. We're all allies here, and I appreciate all my brothers and sisters from Orange County and elsewhere from showing up today and representing. Thank you so much for driving all the way up here to help us out today to deal with this Joel Greenberg situation. I also want to make something very clear. I am an atheist. I am a non-believer, and I know that when they come from my Muslim or Jewish brothers and sisters, well, they're going to come for me too. So if you are an ally to this community, you're an ally to the LGBTQ plus community, it is up to you to stand up today and to deal with Joel Greenberg's Islamophobic comments. It is not acceptable at all. Joel's got to go. It's pretty clear. Joel's got to go. Joel's got to go. Joel's gotta go! It's pretty clear that an apology will not be good enough because Joel Greenberg has been doing this stuff all of his life. And if you're unsure of that, then go ahead and read his Twitter feed where people are posting how they dealt with him as a student at their high school. Look two years backwards into his past on Facebook and you'll see many of these same comments last year, months ago, weeks ago. And you can pretend it's just one Facebook post, but he picked fights on every single comment thread that he could. Joel Greenberg must resign. There is nothing else that makes it okay. So that makes it important and critical that if Joel refuses to do the right thing as he has done so often in his life, the Governor Rick Scott actually step up and show us what real leadership looks like, and that is by removing Joel Greenberg from office now and putting somebody Scott. into that now office that will do the job us. correctly. So I call on Rick Scott to do the right thing if Joel can't figure it out. So let's make this clear one last time. This is a Seminole County issue. This is an Orange County issue. This is a Florida issue. And this is damn straight an American issue. And I will not tolerate hate speech anywhere. Free I speech. live anytime, 
anywhere. I'm gonna show up and be there. I hope you will too. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Lisa Cromar from the Women's March. Yeah, Lisa! Woo! Hi, thank you all for coming. My name is Lisa Santoni Cromar. I'm with the Women's March, Florida. I am a proud Puerto Rican woman, and I would like to enforce what Giovanni's already said. When anyone targets any of us, you target all of us, and we stand together. And just in case it matters, I am a Seminole County resident. I am here to support our Muslim sisters and brothers and condemn Joel Greenberg's continued stream of ignorant, racist, homophobic remarks. To answer his most recent gratuitous insult, two Muslim women created the first university. The Spanish Muslims of Andalusia were strong advocates of education. Stop. That's you. All right, so you're in the right spot. Hey. <laughs> I appreciate that comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. He's pastor of the making. That's what we call that. He's a very, very, yeah. <laughs> All right, it looks like that feed got abruptly switched on us there, but that was a protest for the Seminole County tax collector, Joel Greenberg, apparently under fire. Uh, people are calling for his resignation after he posted a question, proposed a question to his Facebook viewers on his personal Facebook um, that ha was Islamophobic in nature. So big protest down there. We have something else coming up live. We're gonna switch over there in a second once we find out what that is. But first, live right now on the Senate floor, Senator Bill Nelson from Florida, he's speaking uh, to the Senate. Let's take a listen. Dollars to take out a $500 loan. And now, using the CFPB's formula, that equates to an mm -hmm. Tyrod's absolutely absolutely better today. If you don't if you don't have Tyrod in the in the mix, then and you draft him number one, then I say yes. People need to They're color coded. Some of them they may be every in every color depending on their house. Yeah. So. And this was drawn by a counselor and painted by one of our student volunteers. We have our people wear these when they go out and we give lots of thank yous. That's just a sample of one of the groups that came. They came from New Hampshire. And then the bowl. No, remind me, I'm not outside, so I can't remember, but they were sent. You see, I guess this damage right here. Yes. This wall was right down below. Where is it again? Where is this wall right here? No, it's this one right down this hallway. You'll go in there for the FEMA reading. Wall right there or to the left? To the left. It'll be the room for the FEMA reading. Who do we got here? City this is a lot that the Texas Baptist men, one of the trees they cut, they put the cross in and brought us three of them here to the church. This is a sampling of one of our work ports. Many, many, obviously, the states that we have five countries Okay. 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 Okay.
Now I'm good to see you. Uh, the yes. well, last time you were here, work clothes or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly, because you are home the home stuff. So the uh, homes that you've done were homes like that. Yeah. 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 Correct. Yeah. Yeah. We have, uh, yeah. 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 Franklin. I was with him in Alaska. Right. So sorry, yeah. I just came down. He's still in Alaska, so he can't be here. Look at the temperature. 40 degrees at night, but you know, his goal is a thousand families will get back into their homes over the next two years, one year is already passed. We're going to see that happen. Um, We're pushing 150 mobile homes that we've already bought here in Texas. And so they have to go to Great Texas and buy Texas and work those on some of the first states in Texas. That's great. That's a whole lot of it. He wants to see those thousand families get back in their home. I know Katrina was there for five years. Right. Here we're going to really ramp up and go wider. So we're doing a lot of work. membership. Our budget is 70 churches, and we've already said we're going to send them a budget of So going back to the number, we build a child. All right, a little bit of a shaky camera down there in Rockport, Texas, where Vice President Mike Pence is touring the First Baptist Church uh, there in Rockport. I think right now, actually, what you're seeing in the lower left corner of your screen is the Vice President meeting with some disaster relief volunteers from disasters down in Texas. But coming up in a little bit later, he will be participating in a briefing on Hurricane Harvey recovery from Rockport. That's probably why we saw Governor uh, Greg Abbott down there with him. Um, he'll be part of that. He's going to be delivering remarks at the First Baptist Church, and we'll have that on our stream coming up in this hour, I believe, if it all does happen on time. But also, kind of jumping over into the 2 o'clock Eastern Time hour, we do have the White House press briefing coming up from D.C. This will be Sarah Sanders speaking to the press just a day after all of those things came down. Paul Manafort, of course, uh, being found guilty on eight charges, uh, financial crime charges, after the judge declared a mistrial on 10 other counts. And then also um, President Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, also being found uh, guilty for ca campaign finance um, uh, allegations there. So we're going to be hearing from her. We'll see what she says to the media. That is bound to be quite an interesting briefing. And we'll have that here for you as long as it, we can get it up and it does happen on time. We'll make sure that we grab that for you. So until that, let's take a look at some of the top stories of the day. It's very contagious. This summer, the virus sidelined two Major League Baseball players. And just this week, West Virginia University had to cancel its fan day after five of its football players contracted the virus. Dr. Scott Norton, the chief of dermatology at Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C., says it's a common childhood disease and relatively mild, but extremely contagious. He says it can spread rapidly among small children, daycares, preschools, and elementary schools. Because it'll sweep through a community, I think it's important for families and schools and community leaders to realize that we have this right now. Particularly at the beginning of the school year, we don't want to have any outbreaks as these kids all get together once again. So I'd like to get the word out that this is something we're seeing a lot of here in mid-August. Dr. Norton says the viral infection is common this time of year, but says he's seeing more cases this year. He's seeing two to three cases a day at his clinic, and the emergency room is seeing between 10 and 20 cases a day. Children who contract the virus can develop a low-grade fever, sores in their mouth, and have a loss of appetite. But the most obvious symptom is the rash that appears on the hands, feet, and around the mouth. It's both on the palms and soles and the backs of the hands and feet. And we see these very characteristic uh, mini blisters on the hands in particular. They will look like a scattered 
dots, maybe uh, three or four millimeters in diameter, and uh, they usually have a very bright red rim, but they're totally painless. And it can be transmitted one of three ways. It's transmitted three ways. It's transmitted through sort of oral and nasal secretions. So if a child sneezes or coughs on someone, that can transmit it. It can be transmitted directly through contact with the uh, mini blisters on the skin. And the virus can also be transmitted through soil diapers. Dr. Norton says it's best to keep your child home until the blisters dry up, the rash is gone, and there's no more fever. And of course, the best way to prevent the spread of the virus is to practice good hygiene. Wash your hands, use hand sanitizer, and disinfect surfaces. Reporting in Northwest, Jacqueline Kelly, Fox 5 Local News. Dr. Jeffrey Trent with TGen says this study could be the holy grail if successful. Clearly the holy grail would be a non-invasive rapid test that could give us direct, clear information about what's going on in your brain by simply sampling the blood. Or should he say game changer? In CTE, a certain protein starts to clump, slowly killing off brain cells. But it usually happens many years later after numerous head injuries and concussions. This study focuses on tackling CTE beforehand, mainly through blood samples. If you play football for long enough, or any contact sport for that matter, soccer is another one with some of the headers, um, it's, it's a matter of, of when, not if. A study out of Boston shows 99% of deceased NFL players had CTE and 91% of college football players. Dr. Trent's son-in-law and former Arizona Cardinals tight end Alex Dunn is hoping to help researchers diagnose CTE earlier, and he's participating in the study by donating a sample of his blood, saliva, and urine. Completely easy, yeah, it took about 20 minutes, um, really fast, the staff was, uh, was fantastic. So I highly recommend for anyone that's an athlete. I played football at Arcadia High School, hardly the NFL, uh, having a son-in-law who played in the NFL and grandkids that uh, are, uh, have an opportunity to play. Definitely we wanna to try to do what we can to help the next generation. Imagine a rock falling in your front yard from outer space, a stony meteorite. Cody Horvath of Glendale found one and took these pictures. It didn't look like a normal rock and it looked like it had been on fire and it looked like it hit pretty hard. So at that point I thought this might be a meteorite. The really freaky thing is that for most of us it's probably just a rock, but Cody saw something more. So I took it inside to look, um, look it up and found out that there's such a thing as like chondrite stone meteorites. And so once I found that out, it looked very similar to the me meteorite pictures that I found. I was pretty sure that indeed it was a meteorite. The Glendale meteorite is now being studied by Dr. Lawrence Garvey, one of the world's leading experts in meteorites who teaches at ASU. Each meteorite that we pick up is older than the Earth. So this one that we found, that was found in Glendale, is older than the Earth. So by studying its characteristics and its mineralogy, we get clues and insights into our solar system formation. When you hear the name and see the logo for Goat House Brewing, you assume there's some interesting story behind it. It's not until you get to their brew house and you can hear why it lives up to its name. <laughs> People are pretty fascinated with the goats. It's easy to see why. It's not every day you can find a place where you can have a beer, hang out with Brewdog Georgia and 30 of her bearded friends. They're not just kind of like goats. I mean, they have names. Like Shrek, Fiona, Yoda, and Sugar. For the last five years, Michael and Kathy Johnson have drawn in customers for the pints and goat petting. In April, Forbes magazine named the brewery the second fastest growing craft brewery in the country. We draw people from all over, not only in the state, but surrounding states. And um, it's kind of a, I mean, we're the only place to get our beer and, and get this experience is, is right here. Kathy says when they first opened the brewery, there were only about 12 in the Sacramento region. Now there's close to 100, but they're still the only ones that offer you this unique experience of getting to hang out with these guys 
while you sip a beer. While the animals bring the customers in, the Johnsons believe it's really the cold beers that keep them returning because... We like to call it farm to tap. We grow the ingredients, we grow the hops. We have an orchard we pull from. Um, everything is sourced either here on our farm or within like a mile radius. And it's connecting back to where your food, or in this case, beer comes from. Just remember, you may have to watch out for some of that recycled alfalfa, but hey, you'll always have a freshly brewed stout to enjoy. In Lincoln, Pedro Rivera, Fox 40 News. And it looks like Vice President Pence is now making some remarks outside of that facility where he was meeting with some of the disaster relief volunteers. Uh, the governor now speaking. Take a listen. Reactions are pouring in after the body of Iowa student Molly Tibbetts was likely discovered. Vice President Mike Pence tweeting he is heartbroken by the news. The 20-year-old disappeared while jogging in her Brooklyn neighborhood July 18th. Her disappearance prompted a massive month-long search. On Tuesday, 24-year-old Christian Rivera led officials to a body believed to be Molly's in a rural cornfield southeast of Brooklyn. Rivera was then charged with her murder. We have confirmed with Homeland Security Investigations that he is an illegal alien and we believe he has been in this area now for four to seven years. Texas Governor Greg Abbott tweeted in part, an undocumented immigrant is charged for the murder of Molly Tibbetts. This is why so many Americans are angry about sanctuary cities. It's why Texas bans sanctuary cities. It's about safety. 
Tibbetts' death likely to reignite debate over illegal immigration, and President Trump is already weighing in. You heard about today with the illegal alien coming in, very sadly, from Mexico. And you saw what happened to that incredible, beautiful young woman. Should have never happened. Illegally in our country, we've had a huge impact, but the laws are so bad. The immigration laws are such a disgrace. Officials are waiting for positive identification on the body. If Rivera is convicted in Molly's death, he faces life in prison without parole. In Washington, Ray Bogan, Fox News. Well, these are two people who at one time were very close to President Trump. They both primarily faced charges for their own business dealings. But in the case of Cohen, some of the allegations are very close to President Trump. <laughs> President Trump didn't seem to miss a step last night as he led a boisterous rally in West Virginia. But it didn't take long for the special counsel's investigation to come up. Fake news and the Russian witch hunt. We got a whole big combination. Where is the collusion? Just hours earlier, the president's former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, was found guilty of eight financial crimes, a win for special counsel Robert Mueller. It doesn't involve me, but I still feel, uh, you know, it's a very sad thing that happens. This has nothing to do with Russian collusion. And the president is right that the charges against Manafort don't directly relate to him. But his former personal attorney, Michael Cohen, is another matter. He pled guilty yesterday to charges that include campaign finance violations, payments to two women believed to be former adult film star Stormy Daniels and former Playboy playmate Karen McDougal that he claims came at the direction of what prosecutors only describe as a candidate for federal office. And that may be a problem for the president. If the prosecutors accept what is in this indictment, then the president just became an unindicted co-conspirator. Now, none of this means that the president will necessarily be indicted. But if Democrats take over the House in November, they could potentially use these allegations as a basis for impeachment. In Washington, Doug Luzader, Fox News. It was terrifying. It was like the worst day of my life. Lacey Guyton holds tight to her two-month-old daughter as she thinks about what could have happened to Raina Saturday afternoon. The infant accidentally locked in a hot car, 911, unwilling to send police or fire. Then I was just so like shocked and like, okay, they're not coming. I have to get her out of here. Nobody's coming to help me. Lacey was visiting her grandparents in Waterford. It was time to leave. She put Raina in her car seat and the car doors inexplicably locked. The keys were inside and so was the baby on a hot August afternoon. Immediately, Lacey grabbed a chunk of asphalt and tried to break the window while her grandmother called 911. My granddaughter just put her baby in the car and the car door locked and we can't get in. We don't unlock vehicles, unfortunately. The dispatcher said she would transfer them to a tow company, but this wasn't any car. This was a car with a two-month-old baby inside. She says, ma'am, we can't unlock cars or break windows. And then you feel so helpless. You think all the help we thought we were going to get, the only help we were going to get, we don't have it. She said, we have to call a tow company. And I'm kind of like, Grandma, we don't have time to call a tow company. Like, I don't know how many minutes I have, you know, until she's passing out. Unable to break the window, Lacey called 911 again and reached the same dispatcher. Can you send a fire department to come break my window open? I just need it open. I can send you a record service. They will charge you, but a fire department doesn't come out for that. So, okay, because, I mean, she's, like, crying in there. I keep checking on her. She's screaming at this point, making herself even more hot. And... She again tells me that we have to, you know, call a tow company. They don't come out for that. Um, and then she transferred me to a tow company. Finally, Lacey used this tool, broke out the back window, and rescued her baby. She was really sweaty, um, you know, screaming and just, I mean, like drenched in sweat. She's probably in there like 10 minutes. Um, so we immediately just get her out, get her inside, cool her down. It's the most helpless feeling to see your great grandbaby in there screaming and crying and, and just wet with sweat. We want this corrected. We don't want anyone else to lose their baby because this wasn't taken care of for us. The chief of Waterford Police agrees. He apologized to the family and tells us this was definitely a mistake. It's a common sense issue. You know, you call 911, you expect for somebody to come and give you some help, and we certainly should have gone and done that. And we made a mistake, and we didn't, and, and, and we, need to, we need to fix that. 
The chief says this was a veteran dispatcher, someone who really should have known better. He says she will face some disciplinary action and everyone will have more training on how to handle a call like this. I do appreciate their um, apology, but that it's not something that even needs any training to know it's common sense. You send help when somebody is begging you to come help save their child out of a hot car to something that anybody should have known. It's just common sense. In Waterford, Amy Lang, Fox 2 News. They went through it. Right now, Vice President Pence touring recovery efforts in Texas, along with Texas Governor Greg Abbott. Let's take you down there now. He's making some remarks. People were in harm's way, and we uh, respect and admire that, and uh, are grateful, uh, are truly grateful. Uh, lastly, I, I also want to commend uh, uh, Dr. Scott Jones and, and uh, uh, all of all of the uh, members of the Rockport uh, First Baptist Church. And this was a, a church where, um, as the good book says, the rain came down, the wind blew against the house, but um, even though it fell. Uh, this church was there for the community, and not just to rebuild themselves, but to help rebuild this community. And, uh, and Dr. Jones, we thank you. We thank you in the, in the midst of that hardship for uh, putting, uh, uh, putting hands and feet on your faith and making such a difference across this community, as so many other communities of faith uh, did, uh, becoming literally a, a place where volunteers could focus resources and, um, and, uh, and time to help those impacted uh, by the storm. Uh, finally, let me uh, let me say that while we are looking looking back and looking at today about about the impact uh, of the hurricane of a year ago, uh, I want to uh, I, I want to express that uh, our, our hearts and our attention today are with our fellow Americans in Hawaii. Um, FEMA has uh, stood up and is coordinating preparation for Hurricane Lane which will make landfall in the next several days. And let me just say uh, uh, that uh, we want to be very clear uh, with all of those that will be impacted by Hurricane Lane. Uh, Hurricane Lane is a dangerous storm uh, that, uh, that will impact Hawaii. Uh, and uh, we are urging uh, families to make uh, preparations, uh, just as people in Texas did as, uh, as Hurricane Harvey approached. Um, uh, we, uh, uh, we have stood up uh, resources uh, in Washington, D.C., as well as in Hawaii, uh, pre-positioning assets to be prepared uh, for when Hurricane Lane makes uh, landfall. But uh, we encourage people, uh, as always, in Hawaii, listen to your local authorities and for information on the best way to prepare uh, for the impact of a hurricane, uh, you can go to ready.gov and get very helpful information. So the people of Hawaii uh, should know that um, uh, you are on the hearts of every American, and I know they'll be on the prayers of people across this state and across this nation. Governor? Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice President, for being here once again. Uh, you were here in the early days uh, of the storm. Uh, you were here repeatedly after that. Uh, the president was here. The first lady was here. The second lady was here. Uh, one thing that uh, the Trump administration made very clear, and that is you care dearly about the people of the state of Texas. Uh, you cared about uh, a rapid recovery. And we have recovered remarkably uh, because of the robust response uh, that the entire Trump administration provided. And when I say the entire Trump administration, obviously I'm including the president and vice president, but I'm including Brock Long, the Secretary of Homeland Security. Uh, there were so many members of the cabinet uh, who came to the state of Texas who helped us respond. Uh, we know that we have more to do, but as an absolute fact, we would not be where we are today had it not been for the response that you all helped provide. Uh, the, the fact is, uh, Texas has received more money faster in response to this disaster than any prior disaster the state has ever encountered. Uh, we had a Texas-sized storm, and we got a Texas-sized response. Texas has already received more than $30 billion from the federal government. We, we thank you. Uh, we thank you. I'm, I'm looking to see if the, uh, Michael Cloud is here. Uh, the, the member of Congress. We, we express our gratitude to the entire Texas uh, delegation uh, in Congress for working so hard uh, to achieve that. But I want to emphasize something. 
uh, and, and that is we, we do have people at this table with mayors, we have uh, the county judge uh, over here and, and these local officials. Uh, 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 Jimmy, I'm not sure if you slept uh, for, for an entire week. And uh, the, the courage and the fortitude uh, that local officials show in responding to this disaster was matched only by one thing, uh, and that is the courage, resolve, and resilience of our fellow Texans uh, for uh, their dogged uh, response. Uh, our gratitude goes out. We, we would not be where we are in the recovery had it not been for the typical Texas response to this disaster. We know we have more to do. We need to get more people in homes. Uh, I, as governor, and, and working with the federal administration, will continue until every last person uh, is back in their home, every business is back up and running again, uh, and this entire region is going to be rebuilt better than it was before it happened. Last thing I do want to emphasize, and, and that is the level of cooperation and collaboration between the federal, state, and local governments was both seamless and unparalleled and unprecedented uh, in history. Uh, and it's that team effort approach uh, that led to, I think, the tremendous results we have achieved, understanding we have more to do. Uh, but uh, we thank you for uh, working with us. And I must emphasize that the man to your left, uh, Tony Robinson, who was the is the regional uh, administrator here in Texas for FEMA, uh, has done a tireless and very effective job. And Tony, we appreciate you and your leadership and everything that you've done. Thank you. Sure. Appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, Tony, perhaps you could give us an update on the progress that we've made, and then I'll uh, hear from a number of these local officials before we wrap up. Sure. Please. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Thank you for being here. Your presence in the Coastal Bend region, I think, is very important to folks to see that commitment and know that the recovery continues. And thanks for the administration for your continued uh, commitment to the recovery efforts here in the state of Texas. And I have to say thanks to Governor Abbott for his leadership and Chief Kidd and Commissioner Bush for their partnership and support. I think what you hear today is it, this is a team work sport. It takes a partnership and we've had great partnership here in the state of Texas. Also, thanks to Mayor Rios, Mayor Kendrick, uh, Judge Mills. Th that is where the action takes place at the local level and they have been fantastic partners with us, along with emergency management, first responders from around the state. Uh, once again, they came together in the early days in the response, and they've continued to work with us well in the recovery efforts. Administrator Long sends his regrets that he's not able to be here today. He is back in Washington, D.C., and, and I appreciate you saying we've got to prepare for Hurricane Lane. That is a serious threat to Hawaii, so thanks for your comments there. It's been a joint effort in our recovery. We, we provided about $13.8 billion to survivors for Hurricane Harvey. About $1.6 billion of that is for individuals who suffer damage, and that's to help them with rental assistance home repairs and other needs, maybe contents of their homes. The Small Business Administration, who's a great partner of ours, has provided about $3.39 billion in, in low interest loans. And then the National Flood Insurance Program, which is a very, very critical piece of recovery plans, has provided about $8.8 .8 billion. And so one of the things that I would ask our media friends is if anyone out there who has an active flood insurance claim, a flood insurance policy, who's not filed a complaint, Please do that now. That's going to get you on the road to recovery. So if there's anyone out there that suffered damage and hasn't filed a claim, we urge you to do that today. In addition to the financial assistance, we provided over 54,000 households uh, with temporary sheltering at our, te our transitional sheltering assistance program. That's hotel rooms that puts a safe and secure roof over their head so they can begin the recovery process. And then as of today, we provided about 900 million to impacted communities in our public assistance program. That number continues to grow on a daily basis, and we think that'll be roughly in about the five to six billion dollar range when all is said and done. As part of the building back effort, we want communities to come back more resilient. So we want them to build back stronger. And so we've acknowledged the incredible work of the non-governmental organizations, faith-based organizations, volunteers. They have done some phenomenal work, as you've seen earlier today. We did change our policy to allow that, that effort to be included in the state's cost share. So one of the things the administration did early on was made a 90% federal funded disaster recovery here, which really helped with the burden of the, the local communities. And now we've also improved our policy to allow them to use those donated resources, those donated hours to be able to help with that non-federal cost share as well. And uh, we also are working with our housing mitigation grant program. Harvey has given us a great opportunity to look at how we build back and how we build back better. The state has been very, very proactive in, in, in working with local communities on a housing mitigation grant program. 
as of today, we've got about $193 million that's been obligated, already on the street working, and we, we've got probably more projects than we'll have statutory authority to fund, but that's a good problem for us to have to look at what is the best mitigation as we go back. And then finally, um, we have set up a Harvey Recovery Office. To your point, we're committed to be here until the work is done. So while we've done a lot, we still have a lot of work to do. That Harvard Recovery Office, we have an office based in Austin, but we've got a branch office here in Corpus. We are gonna be here and commit to Texas and the locals through the recovery effort. So in closing, uh, I think Administrator Long and the men and women of FEMA wanna thank you once again for your support and the partnership. And we'd also urge all coastal residents that we're in the heart of hurricane season. So know what you're gonna do for your family. Have a plan of action. Ensure you have the necessary supplies most importantly, heed the warning of local officials and review your insurance coverage. Here on the coastal bend, wind insurance, flood insurance are, are very critical, and we see a large insurance gap there, so can't emphasize enough that prepare yourself for the threats and impacts that may impact your community. Thank you very much. Great. Great job, Tom. Great. Um, uh, uh, Mayor Rios, Mayor Kendrick, a word? How are things going? Much better, Mr. Vice President, than we, a year ago. Uh, one of the things I feel really good about it, every evening when I get ready to go to bed, I think about our partners on the state level, partners with the federal level, and it makes me sleep a little easier at night because we've made some tremendous progress over the last year. A long way to go, but uh, working in conjunction with the governor's office has been fantastic. Uh, our federal partners, FEMA, SBA, they, they, they've done what they promised to do. Unfortunately, some of our citizens don't understand what they're supposed to do and they're looking for more but we try to keep that message out there that we are getting the help that we need the help that we're i hate to use the word entitled to but that's that's what it is uh, that's we're getting what we need from y'all uh, we wish it was faster but you know i understand the process but uh, the promises that have been made by the governor's office and with chief kid pushing on his side uh, he's my favorite Aggie. Uh, well, well, maybe, maybe uh, I still call him Governor Perry. Might, might have you out there, but uh, uh, they've been, they've been tremendous in, in helping us. Great, great report, Mr. Vice President. Kendrick. You know, you sit here at a table, and I look around this room, and I see a couple of young men over there that really have stepped up to plate. Nim Kid, and I look over at uh, Reed over there, and I look over at the governor and a smile on his face, and he sat across the table for me one day and said, Fulton will be taken care of. And he has. And you came here after our little experience, and you told me we'd be taken care of. A long time ago, Scott, my pastor, I'm a deacon here. Yeah, I don't know if he's real happy about that sometimes, but, uh, <laughs> you know, especially a politician. but. My daddy always said, and Scott says, you, you're only as good as the testimony your son gives. And you're in charge of FEMA. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, your son here, Tony, and his company has done their job. They promised to help us. They have been there for us every minute. And they've gone out of their way to make sure we're hope. Someday we'll have a normalcy again in our community. Mm -hmm. The Governor Abbott is, is under you too, in a way, because you're our Vice President. The respect we should show to always to the hierarchy above us that teaches us and our families that it's important. And Governor Abbott, you can be proud of your family, your, your people under you, from the DPS to the Border Patrol people who came here after the accident. Uh, NIMS has taken a lot of phone calls from me that weren't always positive. And it's not seeing a smile over there. But as a coach, I have a tendency to lose it. And. Uh, if I had game ball, I'd give all three of you game ball. This is a team sport, and we're starting football season in Texas. It's important in Texas, football. But today, y'all made a difference. And the biggest difference of everything in this whole place is a kid named Jordan Mims. He stepped up to the plate, bought these volunteers into this church under Scott's leadership, and he's Scott's chap. So, gentlemen, God can be a great thing, and God's looking down today, and he saw nothing but a bunch of good disciples helping our community, and I appreciate it. And we are recovering. Great. Thank you, man. It's very eloquent. Um, Chief Kidd, how are we doing? We're doing great. There was Air Marshal Jeopardy game board hanging in the Orlando field office. And this is what started the culture 
of the retaliation um, and discrimination against minority groups. A game former Air Marshal Henry Preston claims was rigged against minorities at OIA. Our Fox station in Charlotte first reporting on the allegations, Preston telling them and now us between 2007 and 2010, his supervisor encouraged the marshals to target African Americans for suspicious persons investigations. It had nothing to do with fighting terrorism whatsoever. Um, all they wanted to do was get stats in what they call surveillance detection reports. Preston says marshals were encouraged to target all minorities, but especially African Americans. What were some of the things they were telling you? Um, go after the blacks, although they use the N-word. Um, they're the ones who have the most warrants. The supervisors, he says, threatened and berated them if they didn't comply. We even had one supervisor tell one of our fans that he would burn their house down. That was the threat? Yes. Now Congresswoman Val Demings writing this letter to the acting inspector general for the Department of Homeland Security, urging him to investigate the, quote, extremely troubling allegations. Congressman Darren Soto also joining in on the fight. Should these allegations prove true, this gentleman needs to be fired and there needs to be a top-down shakeup. Preston says he's brought all this to lawmakers and the TSA. The TSA sending this statement to our Charlotte station, Fox 46. The Transportation Security Administration and Federal Air Marshal Service do not tolerate discrimination of any kind, period. Federal Air Marshals are from all walks of life and come to work every day for one reason, to protect the traveling public. I'm hopeful now, um, but uh, cautious. Florida's Stand Your Ground self-defense law once again in the spotlight, igniting calls for action by civil rights activists and politicians to abolish the hotly debated statute for good. Well, it has happened again, and again we're here, and we're going to keep coming until we see some justice in this case. This time, it's all caught on camera. You Knowing Trayvon Martin, we didn't have a video. It looks like he's been shot and he's dead. I shudder to think of what would happen if there was no video in this case. Video shows Michael Draca use his legally concealed handgun to shoot and kill an unarmed Marquise McLaughlin after he pushed Draca for confronting his girlfriend over a handicapped parking spot. He's on the ground. He's five to or at least 10 feet away. There's no, there's nothing in the ends of the victims that would indicate he's going to shoot, stab, or beat him. And he's in fact turning away. We really don't see any of the factors that would support stand your ground here. The Pinellas County Sheriff initially did not arrest Draca, saying the law prevented him from doing so. Three weeks would pass before the state attorney's office formally arrested and charged him with manslaughter. I think this is gonna be one of those cases where the defense tries to argue stand your ground, but it's not It's not going to be a stand your ground case. It's going to be a manslaughter case with no real defense for why he shot somebody. The 2005 law says people fearing for their lives do not have to retreat before using deadly force to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm. Protesters compare this to the shooting death of Trayvon Martin by George Zimmerman, who claimed self-defense and was acquitted of murder in 2013. It is a law that may be legal, but it's not moral. Draca's lawyers say in part, the legal team is not going to speak publicly about defense strategy, except to say that a wide variety of defenses are being considered. They also plan to fight to get Draca's $100,000 bond reduced at a joint bond and arraignment hearing on Thursday. He faces up to 30 years if convicted. In Clearwater, Florida, Ali Rafa, Fox News. He was crying in pain. And perhaps because Jeff Pigeon's Margate home had more lights on than those of his neighbors, this injured man ended up on his porch. I've been shot. Guy goes up and shot, helped me, and you know, I went to check to see. I thought someone might be playing a prank on me. No one was. My hand in my leg. Please tell me. Please tell me I'm going to for real. Hey, call, call 911. Call 911. Call 911. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. All right, hold on, buddy. We'll take care of it. He actually knocked on the door. So that shows you that that camera just seen the motion and started rolling. The encounter caught on a doorbell camera. 
Late Monday, police said the man may have been shot in the 1800 block of Northwest 65th Avenue, which is just a few blocks away. Somehow this guy managed to get here. Yeah, uh, that's a question we had too, why my door? <laughs> but we don't know, this is a very quiet neighborhood, especially down this street here. We have really no problems. It was just a random thing. Somebody needed help. It's very contagious. This summer, the virus sidelined two Major League Baseball players. And just this week, West Virginia University had to cancel its fan day after five of its football players contracted the virus. Dr. Scott Norton, the chief of dermatology at Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C., says it's a common childhood disease and relatively mild, but extremely contagious. He says it can spread rapidly among small children, daycares, preschools, and elementary schools. Because it'll sweep through a community, I think it's important for families and schools and community leaders to realize that we have this right now, particularly at the beginning of the school year. We don't want to have any outbreaks as these kids all get together once again. So I'd like to get the word out that this is something we're seeing a lot of here in mid-August. Dr. Norton says the viral infection is common this time of year, but says he's seeing more cases this year. He's seeing two to three cases a day at his clinic, and the emergency room is seeing between 10 and 20 cases a day. Children who contract the virus can develop a low-grade fever, sores in their mouth, and have a loss of appetite. But the most obvious symptom is the rash that appears on the hands, feet, and around the mouth. It's both on the palms and soles and the backs of the hands and feet. And we see these very characteristic uh, mini blisters on the hands in particular. They will look like uh, scattered dots, maybe uh, three or four millimeters in diameter. And uh, they usually have a very bright red rim, but they're totally painless. And it can be transmitted one of three ways. It's transmitted three ways. It's transmitted through sort of oral and nasal secretion. So if a child sneezes or coughs on someone, that can transmit it. It can be transmitted directly through contact with the uh, mini blisters on the skin. And the virus can also be transmitted through uh, soil diapers. Dr. Norton says it's best to keep your child home until the blisters dry up, the rash is gone, and there's no more fever. And of course, the best way to prevent the spread of the virus is to practice good hygiene. Wash your hands, use hand sanitizer, and disinfect surfaces. Reporting in Northwest, Jacqueline Kelly, Fox 5 Local News. Dr. Jeffrey Trent with TGen says this study could be the holy grail if successful. Clearly the holy grail would be a non-invasive rapid test that could give us direct, clear information about what's going on in your brain by simply sampling the blood. Or should he say game changer? In CTE, a certain protein starts to clump, slowly killing off brain cells. But it usually happens many years later after numerous head injuries and concussions. This study focuses on tackling CTE beforehand, mainly through blood samples. If you play football for long enough, or any contact sport for that matter, soccer is another one with some of the headers, um, it's, it's a matter of, of when, not if. A study out of Boston shows 99% of deceased NFL players had CTE and 91% of college football players. Dr. Trent's son-in-law and former Arizona Cardinals tight end Alex Dunn is hoping to help researchers diagnose CTE earlier, and he's participating in the study by donating a sample of his blood, saliva, and urine. Completely easy, yeah, it took about 20 minutes, um, really fast, the staff was, uh, was fantastic. So I highly recommend for anyone that's an athlete. I played football at Arcadia High School, hardly the NFL, uh, having a son-in-law who played in the NFL and grandkids that uh, are, uh, have an opportunity to play, definitely we want to try to do what we can to help the next generation. Imagine a rock falling in your front yard from outer space, a stony meteorite. Cody Horvath of Glendale found one and took these pictures. It didn't look like a normal rock and it looked like it had been on fire and it looked like it hit pretty hard. So at that point I thought this might be a meteorite. The really freaky thing is that for most of us it's probably just a rock, but Cody saw something more. So I took it inside 
to look um, look it up and found out that there's such a thing as like chondrite stone meteorites. And so once I found that out, it looked very similar to the me meteorite pictures that I found. I was pretty sure that indeed it was a meteorite. The Glendale meteorite is now being studied by Dr. Lawrence Garvey, one of the world's leading experts in meteorites who teaches at ASU. Each meteorite that we pick up is older than the Earth. So this one that we found, that was found in Glendale, is older than the Earth. So by studying its characteristics and its mineralogy, we get clues and insights into our solar system formation. Well, we're back in the newsroom here at Fox 5 uh, DC Local News, and we have a couple of live videos coming in for you that I want to show you. One, first, the courtroom scene where Christian Bahena Rivera, who has been charged in the abduction and murder of Molly Tibbetts in Iowa. This is the courtroom scene right now. I'm not quite sure what we'll get out of this or if we'll see really anything transpire, but that is what we're looking at there. And then also live inside First Baptist Church in Rockport, Texas. This is where uh, Vice President Pence will be making some remarks. Again, that was slated for about 1.45 Eastern time. Hasn't come up yet. Uh, looks like they are pushing it a little bit. It's a little bit late. So we'll see uh, what is to come here and what's going to get started up. Later in the 2 o'clock hour, we're expecting Sarah Sanders at the podium in the White House press briefing room for the first briefing since yesterday's charges came out against Paul Manafort, former chairman of the campaign and uh, former lawyer for President Trump, Michael Cohen. She's sure to be answering some tough questions there from the press. So we're going to hope to bring that to you if you do stay live on our stream. We'll also have that streaming on our Facebook page, Fox 5 DC, so don't forget to check us out on all platforms. Courtroom is kind of moving around here. Let's kind of check in there. It looks like they're trying to get some eyes on something um, inside this courtroom again. I don't have too much information on this. I'm going to find out more for you, though, but uh, we should be seeing some type of movement here in the courtroom where uh, Bahena Rivera, he is in court for the murder of Molly Tibbetts. In the following days and months, First Baptist Church and our community received donations and volunteers from across Texas and from every state in the U.S. And I speak on behalf of the members of First Baptist and on behalf of many in the community when I say that we are thankful for the help we receive from governmental agencies, from non-governmental agencies, from churches and private citizens from across Texas in the United States and around the world. With your help, we have made incredible progress in our recovery efforts, so I want to thank all of you. Recently, I read how the approach of the anniversary of a natural disaster like Hurricane Harvey means that the community is entering what is called the disappointment phase of recovery. The heroic phase is over, where people worked hard to bring help and relief to those directly affected by the storm. The honeymoon phase is over, where we all work together with a strong sense of community and optimism when we said we were Rockport strong while standing in lines at food trucks in the FEMA tent. Wait. Now, many people have moved on, while a great many have not. 
There has been progress, but the recovery effort is far from over. And there is a sense of frustration, anxiety, and disillusion in certain segments of the community. I think the rebuild effort will be long, difficult, and slow. The whole community must come together again to find the resiliency to help one another go forward through the rebuilding phase. In the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah reminds us that God gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. That's why it is important to have an event like this. And that's why it is so significant to have the Vice President and all of you here with us today. We have come, come very far, but we are not finished yet. We are not alone, and we are in this together. And together, we can continue the slow but steady progress toward recovery. Together we can do our best to leave no one behind. And the citizens of Texas have been with us on every step of this community's journey since the storm. And now it is my privilege to turn the microphone over to the governor of the great state of, state of Texas, Greg Adams. Thank you all so very much. Thank you so very much, Pastor. Thank you very much uh, for uh, what you said. Thank you for what you've done. And thank everybody in this room for what you've done. And listening to your words, Pastor, I got to thinking about something that is so true. I can say this for everybody in this room and everybody who's ever lived. God is not done with us yet. God continues to work through all of us. And God is not done with Rockport or Texas yet. God is going to work through us to continue to rebuild the entire region. But I, I particularly want to commend the First Baptist Church of Rockport for the way that you have responded with quintessential Texas resilience. I was here in the early days when the wall was torn down. The building was devastated. There had to be uncertainty about whether or not the church would ever reopen again. And of course, in the Sunday after the hurricane, there was a gathering just outside and then gathering inside even without any type of power. I say that, I guess, falsely, you had no electric power, but you had power from God Almighty above who made sure that you had what you need. We wouldn't be here if it weren't for leaders like a great pastor. We wouldn't be here if it weren't for leaders like your local mayors. We would not be here without the resilience, without the heart, without the commitment of our fellow Texans. I have never been prouder either as governor, as a Texan, or as a human being to see the way that you responded to the worst of disasters ever to hit the state of Texas. I will tell you this. Listen, I know not everybody is yet back in their home. I know that the community is not yet rebuilt. I know there are miles to go before this race is finished. But it's worth emphasizing and understanding both the magnitude and the speed with which the response has happened. Because understand this very important fact. First, in responding to this disaster, there was a more seamless collaboration between the federal government, the state government, and the local government than in any response that had ever happened before. Second, even though more resources are needed, 
Already, Texas has received more financial resources faster than ever before in response to any disaster in the state of Texas, with the commitment by the federal government to make sure those resources will continue coming, because our goal is this. Our goal is to do far more than just rebuild. Our goal is to ensure that we rebuild all of these communities better than the way they were before Hurricane Hardy hit. In times of challenges like this, this is not understand that our communities could have been ripped apart, but in typical Texas fashion, this enormous challenge actually brought us together. And it's my firm belief that the reason why we were brought together is because you and our fellow Texans have been guided by the grace of God. We understood who our author was. We understood that if we follow God's lead, that is the surest pathway to ensuring that we are not only fulfilling God's will, but we are doing what He wants us to do. And as Psalm 46 reminds us, God is our refuge and our strength, an ever-present help in times of trouble. It is God who guides us through these challenges and gives us the strength to overcome these challenges. Well, someone who has helped us overcome these challenges is someone who was here from the very beginning and has been here repeatedly. He has been seen in shirt sleeves in 95 degree heat and 100% humidity, dragging trees and limbs away uh, from houses uh, to accelerate the process of rebuilding homes. A man who uh, has been a constant advisor and collaborator with me in working with the federal government and working with the Trump administration, and that is our tremendous Vice President of the United States, Mike Pence. So I would now like to introduce the Vice President of the United States of America, to see Rockport and Texas coming all the way back. As Governor said, we have more work to do. But I came here today on President Trump's behalf to reaffirm all the people, not just of Rockport, but all across this region, is that this administration is going to work with this governor, with all of the wonderful, outstanding volunteers and faith communities across this region until we rebuild Rockport and all of Texas bigger and better than ever before. So thank you all for coming out. And more importantly, I'll say more of this along the way. Just thank you. Thank you for your inspiring example. You truly inspired the nation. Think of the devastating hurricane that came ashore and the way that this community responded, people across Texas responded, volunteers from all across America and in some cases all across the world came alongside to help this community rebuild. And I have to tell you, it wouldn't be possible without leadership. So let me, uh, let me begin by bringing greetings from a man who loves Texas and who's going to be so excited to hear my first-hand account of the extraordinary progress. His client. Mr. Rivera, are you able to understand today's proceedings through the interpreter? Yes. 
The defense has filed a motion for a private hearing. The defense has also filed a resistance to the use of the expanded media. We'll hear arguments on that motion first. Mr. Richards. May it please the court, uh, Mr. Prosecutor. I pulled a case law this morning from the Iowa Court of Appeals. And it's State versus Jack Hayes, filed October 3rd, 2012. It's number 2 701 slash 11 0669. There's a little piece in that case that talks about expanded media coverage. This particular court, the court there granted the expanded coverage, but the Supreme Court concluded that it's within the discretion of the judge to exclude the expanded media coverage based on circumstances of the particular proceeding. Such coverage would materially interfere with the rights of the parties for a fair trial. And it's based on constitutional rights. And essentially, the prejudice here is the decision beforehand to lean in favor of one side or the other, which prevents justice. In this particular case, the coverage that's out there is leaning all one way. And in fact, the government has weighed in at the highest levels of a predisposition that this young man, Christian, is guilty. But in our system of justice, is entitled to that presumption of innocence until some evidence is presented. At this time, there's been no evidence presented, Your Honor. And so we're urging the court to prevent the cameras from coming in here, which possibly could show some sort of bias or prejudice, and get it into this political controversy of portraying Christian as something that he isn't. In some ways, I view this as a political payback for what's swirling around in terms of the, of the media. And the media is feeding into it. They have not made efforts, as far as I can see, to give justice or any type of leaning towards this presumption of innocence. And therefore, we're asking this court to uh, exclude the media uh, from these proceedings because it could be just one nod of the head, one glance, one sleight of hand that will be partially taken out of context and presented over and over, uh, which would be highly prejudicial to the defendant. So I urge the court to exclude the media from these proceedings. Thank you. Mr. Brown, would you like to make an argument? Yes, Judge. Um, we have, first of all, the state has no objection to the expanded media request that's been filed. Uh, I think they follow proper procedure here. Uh, Mr. Grove, I think, is the uh, regional media coordinator. Um, it's very routine in cases that garner some sort of high profile that the media has interest. Uh, the Supreme Court has provided rules. Uh, for the court to follow in um, allowing uh, media coverage of cases and court proceedings. So we would have no objection to the expanded media request. There's been one request for a video camera, one request for a still camera, uh, again, which is very usual uh, under the circumstances of cases um, like this. Um, this is certainly not the only high profile case or case that has garnered media attention in the state of Iowa. So, we have no objection to the media, uh, expanded media request in this case. I would assume that once this case proceeds beyond initial appearance, uh, whoever the district court judge that is assigned to this case um, will probably readdress uh, that issue. Um, secondly, there's been a motion filed. I just got this whenever I walked in this, uh, this afternoon, but a motion for private hearing pursuant to Iowa Rule of Criminal Procedure 2.24. I think that's what uh, Mr. Richards here was uh, referencing whenever he was arguing that there's a substantial uh, probability that the defendant's right to a fair trial will be prejudiced by the publicity that closure of this particular proceeding would prevent. He has not identified anything that would happen today 
in this particular hearing, uh, that would create any type of substantial probability that his fair trial would be impacted. Um, he wants to talk about whatever the political discourse is that's been surrounding this charge or this case. Certainly, we have no control over that. Um, but it is what it is at this point. I mean, there's a lot of information that's out there about this case, about this particular charge. Um, I think all the court is going to do is follow uh, Rule 2.2 in the initial appearance, advising him of uh, his rights, uh, making sure he's got counsel, that he's either retained or appointed, and addressing an issue of a, a preliminary hearing and whether or not he demands that. I, I fail to see how any uh, substantial probability uh, of, of uh, any impact on the defendant's fair trial would be uh, raised in this particular uh, proceeding. So we would ask that the motion for private hearing be denied and that the expanded media request be granted. Thank you. If, if I may respond, Your Honor. Briefly. Uh, procedures weren't followed. I entered my appearance this morning, attempted to after, shortly after 8 a.m. The e-file system was, was down or crashed. I did not see the motion for expanded media coverage until 12 o'clock today. And if that motion was filed yesterday, Christian was still self-represented. He was never served a copy of that notice, and I was never received a physical copy, although I do acknowledge I did see it at 12 o'clock today. It was my first opportunity, first knowledge that the e-file system was back up. So the rules haven't been complied with, and I would object on the rules, being as the prosecutor says the rules were followed. They were not followed. Mr. Richards, I'm aware of the fact that we had technical difficulties this morning with the e-filing system that the Iowa Judicial System uses. Because I was aware of that, I made contact with both you and Mr. Brown, notified each of you of the expanded media coverage first thing this morning, explained the difficulties we were having in making the paper copies available to you, and said that as soon as you arrived at the courthouse, we would make everything available to you if EDMS was not available at that time. I believe we've followed the procedures that are available to us and we have gone out of our way to make sure that while we were having technical difficulties throughout the state that we were making you aware of things that were being filed. In fact, we allowed you to file an early appearance by fax, which would not be a normal procedure because EDMS was down also. So you did take advantage of the fact that the court was working with you and trying to accommodate for the technical difficulties we're having. At this time, I'm going to rule on the uh, motion for a private hearing and also the request for expanded media coverage. With a reminder to everyone that the defendant will not be asked to make any statements related to facts in this case today, I make the fi following finding. The defendant's right to a fair trial is not prejudiced by the publicity as related to the initial appearance. Reasonable alternatives have been established, including limiting media coverage to one video camera and one still camera. Today's initial appearance will be held in open court and the media will be allowed to stay in the courtroom. Mr. Richards, you also filed a motion for a gag order and in discussions that were held off the record prior to today's hearing, you indicated that you intended for that gag order to be heard by a district court judge. Is that still your intent? I believe that's the proper procedure, Your Honor. Okay. I will um, file a calendar entry asking the district court to set that for hearing. We are now going to move on to the initial appearance. Mr. Rivera, this is your initial appearance on the charge of murder in the first degree and on an immigration detainer notice of action filed by the Department of Homeland Security. The purpose of an initial appearance is to make sure you understand the charges against you, to review any request for an appointment of an attorney, to set further proceedings or court dates in this matter, and to discuss your terms of release from jail. Mr. Rivera, do you have any questions about the things we'll be covering today? No. 
Mr. Rivera, you have been charged with murder in the first degree in violation of Iowa Code Section 707.2 sub 1 sub A, a Class A felony. Mr. Rivera, have you been given copy of this paperwork? Uh, yes. The Department of Homeland Security has filed an immigration detainer notice of action for you. Mr. Rivera, have you received a copy of this paperwork? I believe so. Mr. Rivera, I'm now going to review rights that every defendant has in a criminal action. These include the following. You have the right to an attorney. Every defendant has the right to retain legal counsel and shall be allowed reasonable time and opportunity to consult an attorney. In the event you are indigent and desire counsel, and if the offense is a serious misdemeanor or greater, an attorney can be appointed to represent you. Mr. Rivera, at this time you are represented by a privately retained attorney, Alan Richards. Do you wish to continue with this private representation, or do you wish to file an application for a court-appointed attorney? Uh, no, with Richard. Mr. Rivera, if at any time today, during today's proceedings, you wish to talk to your attorney, please let me know and I'll stop today's hearing. Okay. Next, you have the right to be released from custody. Every defendant in custody has the right, subject to conditions, to be released from custody pending judgment. A defendant may be released from custody on his or her own personal recognizance or on conditions as the court determines as will reasonably assure the defendant's appearance as required and will reasonably assure the public's safety. If the court imposes conditions for defendant's release and defendant is unable to meet these conditions, the defendant has the right to request a bond review hearing. If the defendant is indigent and unable to retain legal counsel, the court will appoint an attorney to represent you for the purposes of this bond review hearing. Next, you have the right against self-incrimination. A defendant is not required to make any statement concerning the offense charged to the court, to any law enforcement officer, or to any other person. But if the defendant makes any such statements, those statements can be used against the defendant. And finally, defendants have a right to trial. Every defendant has the right to a trial and to be tried by a jury if requested. At such trial, defendant has the right to assistance of counsel, the right to confront and cross-examine witnesses against him, the right not to be compelled to incriminate himself, and the right to subpoena the attendance of any witness on your behalf. Mr. Rivera, do you have any questions about the rights I've just gone through? No. Next, we're going to discuss the next steps in your case. The next step would be a preliminary hearing. The purpose of a preliminary hearing is for the court to determine whether there is probable cause to believe that an offense has been committed and that the defendant committed it. A defendant charged with a public offense other than a simple misdemeanor is entitled to a preliminary hearing with two exceptions. One is if trial information is filed against the defendant by the prosecutor, or two, the defendant waives the preliminary hearing on the record. Mr. Rivera, do you wish to waive your preliminary hearing today, or do you wish to have it scheduled? I want to talk to him. To his attorney?
Ah, uh, yes, I want a hearing. Mr. Rivera, I will schedule your preliminary hearing on September 4th, 2018 at 1 p.m. Judge, can that be heard on that date? Yes. I, I realize it gets 10 days. I think 10 days would probably run on that Saturday. Is why you set it for the board. Correct. Um, Monday is a holiday. I understand. We have we are making plans to have the trial information and minutes done, and we anticipate having it done by the thirty first. Um, if you want to set it for that day, so we get it ahead of the holiday, that's that's what we would suggest. Um, if we need, I guess, to the fourth, we can let the court know that that our plan is to have it done by that Friday, August thirty first. If you could give us an afternoon time, that would be um, that would be nice for us. So if we can get that done, thanks. Mr. Richards is set, is an August 31st, 2018 at 2 p.m. date for the preliminary hearing acceptable to you? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Rivera, your preliminary hearing will then be set for August 31st, 2018 at 2 p.m. Mr. Rivera, I now need to review with you the maximum penalties for your charge. If found guilty of the charge of murder in the first degree, the maximum penalty will be imposed. The maximum penalty is life in prison without the possibility of parole. This sentence cannot be deferred or suspended. The defendant will be required to provide a DNA sample and may be required to register with the sex offender registry. And if not a US citizen, a plea of guilty can result in additional immigration consequences up to and including deportation. The immigration detainer notice of action requires that at the completion of this criminal matter, you be transferred to the Department of Homeland Security to keep complete processing and assessment of your citizenship. Mr. Rivera, do you have any questions about the penalties or requirements as listed? Mr. Rivera, we're now going to discuss the terms of your release from jail. I must now set bond in terms of your release from jail. In making these decisions, I take into account whether you will appear for future hearings if you are released and whether the public will be safe if you are released. Mr. Brown, do you wish to make any arguments on behalf of this? Just briefly, Judge, uh, yesterday whenever we um, uh, discussed this charge and authorized it. It was presented to Judge Gammon, I believe. Uh, we had no input on the bond. I noticed that she had initially set a bond amount as $1 million cash only. If I had been asked at that time what I thought the, the bond should be, I would have uh, requested a $5 million bond cash only. That's what we would request here. Uh, we think it is appropriate given the severity of the charge uh, is what his immigration status, at least as it's been described to me, uh, and um, the fact that what he's accused of obviously is a very heinous crime, and um, the, certainly the, the safety of the community should be foremost in the court's mind uh, whenever setting bonds. So that's what we would request that bond be set in amount of $5 million cash only. Thank you. Mr. Richards, would you like to make any argument on bond in terms of release? Yeah, yes, Your Honor. Christian uh, is a young young man. He's been working for a number of years for a respectable uh, person in this community. Uh, no prior criminal record. He sits here presumed innocent. Uh, there's been no evidence at all introduced to the court. Uh, and there is actually no history. Uh, when he came to this country as a minor, he had the equivalent of a seventh, maybe eighth grade education. So his understanding of these proceedings is what's going on. We are urging the court to be fair uh, to Christian with his rights, including his bond. And I have great respect for the court and your honor that you will protect those rights. And so we ask you to do that. But one of those would be setting a bond that at least somewhat may be attainable. attainable. We will. Uh, take a look at your ruling and, and probably ask for a review hearing on the matter regardless. Thank you. Mr. Rivera, you're not required to say anything at this appearance, but you are given the opportunity to say something. Would you like to say anything before I order the terms and conditions of your release from jail? 
No. Mr. Rivera, the following terms of release from jail are ordered. Bond in the amount of $5 million, cash only, in the name of the defendant only, and only after approval for pretrial release by the Department of Corrections. If released, you may not leave Powsheet County, Iowa without written consent of the court. You must turn over your passport or any other travel documents issued by the United States or any other country to the Powsheet County Sheriff's Office within 24 hours of this initial appearance. You must submit to the Department of Corrections for pretrial release supervision for review, approval, and registration for participation by the department at least 48 hours prior to the release from jail. That means that if you are not accepted for supervision by the Department of Corrections, you will not be able to post bond to be released from jail. Mr. Rivera, do you have any questions about the terms and conditions that I have just listed? No. Mr. Brown, is there anything you believe the defendant should be apprised of today before I close the record? Judge, I assume there's been a probable cause finding made um, pursuant to the rule. Um, yes, there has been a probable cause finding for the charge of murder in the first degree. Okay. Uh, other than that, no, I don't have anything further. Mr. Richards, is there anything that you believe the defendant should be apprised of today before I close the record? We're, so, we're satisfied with the court's procedures today. The preliminary hearing shall be scheduled for August 31st, 2018 at 2 p.m. This closes the record. So there you have it, guys, the preliminary hearing scheduled for Mr. Rivera, the suspect in this Molly Tibbetts case, this horribly tragic case uh, that really has come to an end now in Iowa. Uh, the new date set for his next appearance, September 4th. So a lot of details to be fleshed out. Obviously, many, many steps in um, this process of his trial. Uh, but there is a first look at the suspect in that case just a day after they announced that um, he uh, allegedly led uh, officials to her body in a cornfield in Iowa. So lots more to come from that. With that, guys, we're going to close it out in our newsroom here. I'm Molly Navola. Check out our Facebook page, fox5dc.com, our website as well, for a live look at the White House press briefing that's happening right now. Go ahead and go to that if you want to take a look a day after the Manafort and uh, Michael Cohen scandal comes to a close as well. So Sarah Sanders speaking right now on our Facebook page. Check it out. We'll catch you again in-house here for our YouTube channel tomorrow at 1130. Catch you then.